Welcome to Oz by Drone. I'm Greg. And before we get started today, I'll just let you know we've got some problems with the internet. As always, we're in this third world country known as Australia where our internet is slower than anywhere else in the world. And uh, after the show, I will re-upload a copy of the video. So if you have a look in that corner over there above the television, you will see after the show, there will be a replay link there. Click on that and you'll be able to watch the replay. So don't miss a thing. We've got some great stuff today. We've got some really good news stories. We've got a great guest coming after the news. Um, we've got some great Vegemite stuff, which we'll talk about later, all of our Oz videos. And we've even got things that I don't think we're going to get to at the end of the show today. So before we do anything, what have you been up to, John? I hear there's some weird stuff happening at the moment. Where are you, first of all? I'm just looking. We don't have audio coming up for John. Let me try that again. Ah, can I just pause you, John? Have a look down the bottom underneath, John. Go down the very... No, no, no. Go down the bottom. That one. There we go. Try again. Hello, 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 hello. Okay, let's restart that again. What's okay. happening? Where are you? Well, I'm about 10 kilometres south of Coon Barabran. Uh, I, I won't even try and spell it to you. It's a great little place in New South Wales, uh, up, out in the country here in the bush. And I've been in Gunnedah the last uh, four days doing the IMEX Expo, which is the energy innovation and mining. We've been demonstrating uh, UAVs to councils, uh, to mining people. And it's been a great uh, time up here in the bush flying around and uh, giving them a look at what the technology does. Of course, the mining companies have got some aeroplanes already, but uh, we've, been, we've had a great time up here. It's been wonderful. And as well as that, demonstrating the great Aussie salute to our visitors today. Absolutely. i got flies everywhere coming in and you can hear trucks whizzing by and, yeah, we're out in the bush. But it's a, a lovely Sunday morning here, beautiful sky, so I'm hoping to catch some flying uh, on my way down to Dubbo where we're going to be visiting the council there and doing some more flying. So it's been a busy week. Um, after Dubbo we go to Melbourne, we're doing okay. some 3D modelling. So big, big week coming up. Sounds good. And we've got some news this week that I want to start with. First of all, the, the story about what's been happening with CASA and DJI and the Inspire yeah, 2 and all of that. What's going on? Well, what's interesting, you may have heard about the warning of the TB50 and TB55 batteries, uh, mostly for the Matrice aircraft, the 210, and also the Inspire 2. So there's been a warning about in-flight failures um, for those batteries. Now, we don't have what we call an MOS here uh, for aircraft under uh, for drones, but uh, CASA has issued the first um, AD or Air Aircraft Directory um, to all operators and warning of uh, the battery failures and so forth. So it's a big step forward uh, in the way the regulator communicates with us and so how if we they put manage that. that. If we put that in the context of general aviation or commercial aviation, what's the equivalent document there? Uh, absolutely, and they call it an AD, an Aircraft Directory. The same so thing. Yep, so this is, this is like a serious warning to aircraft operators and manufacturers about a potential problem. That's exactly right. And the process is um, legislative. So uh, when we get these warnings, they're rather official. They come on the letterhead with the, uh, the government uh, stamp on it. Um, so it is the very first one that we've seen and in terms of a warning and how that's been notified. So okay. if, if you are flying a light aircraft and you're having uh, cracks in the propeller hubs or there was problems with an air, with a particular aircraft, an AD instantly goes out to the operators of that aircraft. So here we go. We've got an AD and um, it's, it's been exciting. It, it was basically very much like a general aviation AD uh, for warning. And I'll just add on to that, um, that we also have had some P4 batteries. That's what I was, yeah. I, we've got an exclusive here. So yep. something about the Phantom 4 batteries, and we've got a photo, but just tell us, what's this photo? Well, the photo...
just sheet copper, and they seem to um, show that type of arcing under the uh, hotter conditions. So flying in sport mode, anything like that where you're using um, high amperage on the aircraft, you want to check your battery um, because uh, that's a pretty much a throwaway device, you know, throwaway situation if you start getting that arcing and the battery will fail. We've also noticed some swelling in the batteries as well. So in the last two weeks, um, we've got three batteries that we're, we're looking at pretty closely and we'll probably test them further um, to see uh, if we can notify where it comes. We're going to be talking to DJI, but um, all the P4 drivers using that battery, be very careful. Have a good look at your terminals. Make sure that they uh, they look intact and you won't have a problem, of course. Are these the high-capacity ones or the standard ones? Both. We've both. seen it in both, yep. Uh, so just, just the P4 battery generally. I don't think it's, um, it relates to the capacity as such. And it definitely re results from uh, the current draw. And also we've noticed it happens in higher temperatures. So obviously the battery's getting hot, aircraft's getting hot, but in the high drain, you're getting that arcing across the copper terminals. Now, uh, you know, any engineer, an electronic engineer will tell you, those should probably be uh, circular uh, pins, in fact, solid pins uh, for that type of current draw. So, yeah, without going as far as saying it's a design flaw, um, it's pretty close. Yeah. Okay, look, that's interesting that we've got that exclusive, but before we do anything else... Let's go and look at the news. Yep. And as always, I just want to thank uh, Jeff Sills for putting our news information together. He does a great job with that every week. There's lots, lots, lots more. If you have a look in the description for the video, you can have a look at all of the rest of the news, but this is just our little highlight reel. So starting at the very beginning. Absolutely. We've, we've got the Terminator. This is pretty exciting. They're using the current through it to go and get it to do particular things. It's liquid gallium. They're going and pulling the metal using the electromagnetic current around it. And in, in the example that you saw in that circle, effectively reinventing the wheel. <clears throat> And just a really, really cool thing about that is the fact that it's Australia and China together researching and doing this. So some, some really Absolutely. good stuff out of Australia. And our second story today, as I press that button, is... Okay. Now, this, this is one. an interesting one. It Oops, probably... I pressed the wrong one. It's not Terminator. Oh, yeah. There you uh, go. Try that. that. There we go. Um, this is a good one. Uh, and, and you roll the video here because... of the country see the benefits in documenting their sacred sites um, for the rest of the world to enjoy and, uh, and, and capture it, which is fantastic. Okay. Look, that's really cool. I'm hearing from um, one of my friends down there that John's audio is disappearing at times when we're switching shots. It's the opposite of what's happening with um, Ken's show, and it's actually Ken that let me know. So I'll get my producer to keep an eye on the levels when John's talking. Let's move on to our third story. So... We're going to jail, and this is a request for a takeout. Um, unfortunately, though, they're not delivering food. No, they're not. Seven members of a gang which use drones to deliver around...
So John's talking there in the background, but he's not coming up. And I'll have a look at that in a couple of minutes. But long story short, we've got um, seven people jailed over the drone mail prison drug smuggling plot, half a million pounds worth of drugs um, into prison cell windows. And you saw that going in there a short while ago. This sort of um, use of the technology is being expanded all the time. That's a that's a big haul. Five hundred thousand pounds, I suppose. It's well over a million dollars Australian. It would be easy a million dollars US, I imagine, in two to one. So that's uh, that's big bucks. The current rate for uh, jails in Australia is two thousand dollars a mobile phone and uh, six hundred dollars for a pack of tobacco, I believe. But um, you know, th this is going to be something that they're going to have to mitigate against. Uh, in the future, of course. Um, but these guys are now in the jail. It's so the they're hoping perhaps shot. they can get deliveries um, that way. So let's see what happens. Yep. Okay, so I'm just going to give a quick instruction to my little offsider over here. It's the bottom layer shot that's not giving audio, and uh, we'll have a look at that, see if we can fix that up. Anyway, moving right along, our next story of the day, we've got Drone Shield. And let's see if John's audio works this time. Let's put Am that up. Am I here? Testing one, two. You are. Let's put the yeah. picture up. All and right. See if drone you're still shields. There. Latest product is known as the drone node, and it is an evolution of existing drone cannon product released earlier this month. It's described as a portable, compact, and inconspicuous counter drone jamming device which can be used at large outdoor events uh, without raising public concern. However, I still have concerns about it. Um, however. Um, you know, this is uh, something, again, that we're going to see more and more of and how it's used, perhaps, uh, safely is a, a situation because obviously bringing down an aircraft is not necessarily the safest option. But having um, said that, some of the interesting things about this is, A, that it's an Australian company that's yep. developing the technology, so interesting that's there. In Australia, however, it's currently not legal. So no, it's not legal yet um, and the, it, because... Uh, Drones are classified as aircraft, JAA, as we say, just another aircraft. And interfering with an aircraft in flight is most definitely illegal. Two years jail time. You use lasers or anything else to uh, interfere with an aircraft and you go to the clink. So um, Ken Heron, who's got that lovely thing that he's putting on his new shirts, um, maybe we can get an Australian one um, drawn up. You know, you're going around doing some commercial work. Please don't talk to me because if you interfere with this aircraft, you can go to jail. <laughs> Stop people from <laughs> annoying you. Yeah, well, we'll see how that goes as well. But I hope that, that um, you know, it's made clear, obviously, when there's a temporary restricted area around a site, um, perhaps that's reasonable, saying, well, you can't fly here. There's a large-scale public event. And if you do, you'll notice that your aircraft will be interfered with. So there are uh, pathways to that. But at the moment, it's uh, covered by the Surveillance Act as well. And so you can't actually legally track or establish a listening device. This on one someone. is not, this one wouldn't be an issue with the Surveillance Act. It's just a dumb blaster. It doesn't track, it doesn't do aeroscope. It's a, yep. It sends out jamming signals and it, um, it has a range of about one kilometre and it's got just one big red button. Can we put that picture on the screen again? I think. Right, it's a bit hard to see, but there's a red button there. You press oh, the red button <laughs> and the drones will all land either in place where they are or they will return to home depending on how they are programmed. But the interesting thing is jump, uh, jamming 2.7, 5.8, and it's also jamming GPS with a range of one kilometre radius around that device. Now, that's the only way to really jam all uh, models, if you like, GPS signals. Um, that's an interesting one too. You know, jamming GPS signals, not necessarily the best way to go. Um, you know, all sorts of emergency services use it. Um, you might have to have an ambulance or a fire uh, brigade operating at a large-scale event. And, of course, God, if they haven't got GPS going to be a sad day so we've got a long way to go to work this out yet make sure it works for everybody yeah our next story we're going to have a look at the xiaomi um, a new product that they have released let's play that clip so this is a newer product in their line we don't have any audio for the clip but that's all good um, the interesting thing about this drone, it's priced at $300 US or less than $300. I believe it is $269. Um, but it is a portable GPS equipped drone. 
So really useful in that low-end GPS market for people that want to do some filming and photography, possibly competing with the DJI Spark. Yep. Um, one of the interesting things that I saw about it was the fact that it's got some terminals on, on the drone that you can connect to it and use that for either drop lines or LEDs or lighting or all sorts of other things. But interesting that they're doing that kind of flexibility and upgradability and we've just got the DJI Enterprise released recently. That's right. Yes, uh, the, fa uh, the Mavic 2 Enterprise, uh, very capable aircraft, certainly in different price bracket. Yeah. Um, but of course, uh, oh, look at that. So you've got some, uh, you plug in your LEDs. Uh, plug in a smoke trailers. generator. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot, looks like a lot of fun um, and certainly an interesting price um, there. There we go, firing fireworks. Uh, they've really gone to town here, haven't they? And of course, we've got FPV uh, goggles as well. So, yeah, interesting. And I noticed it's got a built in built screen into the. Uh, uh, some people really favour that, having a screen built into the transmitter as well. Um, so, it'd be interesting to look at the specs of it, see what the range and so forth is. I tell you what, it'd be hard to touch a spark in terms of range and flexibility. Those that people that own a spark know how capable that little aeroplane is. Yeah, the Xiaomi has um, got a pretty good reputation overall in that budget price range. I haven't yep. flown one myself, but be interesting to have a look at. Yep. Moving on to our next story, we have delivery. So before we were delivering drugs, what are we delivering now? Looks like Japan Post uh, said Friday that it will test deliveries using a drone between post offices in F Fukushima. Um, uh, prefecture. So it, it's a great idea. One of the things about deliveries that we've even found in Australia is that in Canberra, um, in the southern suburbs there, now we've got a temporary area that's um, listed for trialling deliveries. And this is the way this technology is going to move forward for postal deliveries and other things to have an actual corridor established for the aircraft to operate in. Um, don't know how far beyond visual on a site they're going to be operating. But, um, but the interesting enough. thing, that that is fully automated, autonomous, zero pilot, zero observer. Ob yep. observer. Japan have actually approved that. So that's yep. pretty cool. But you can do that if you're using a corridor, um, again, a safety True. corridor, so that if, if the aircraft is tracking autonomously over a safe area um, where it's not going over people and so forth, you can use that. Um, uh, those sort of approvals are much more straight ahead. Probably we're still not high altitude, of course, that would make sense, but low altitude um, uh, restrictions where manned aircraft know that there's going to be drone deliveries in that area works fine. Absolutely. So our next story, we've only got two left before we get to our guests. So an environmental thing with regard to sediment. Yep. The Queensland government investigates concerns raised by environmental groups that sediment runoff by more from more than 2,000 hectares of cane farming land south of Mackay is potentially polluting the waterways, leading to the Great Barrier Reef. Of course, we know this for a while and it's uh, causing great concern and stress on the reef. Um, but uh, this is a great way to document it now too and water sampling becoming very, very commonplace uh, using UAVs, drones for that sort of uh, technology as well. But also, you know, doc regularly documenting is what, what we have here. So uh, in the past where you would, uh, you know, have to set up days and weeks of water monitoring and sampling, here you could go out every morning and have a time lapse, if you like, uh, of the actual events and how it's happening. So you can look at pre-rainfall events, during, rain, after rainfall, and have a look at the runoff and see how it's actually affecting in relation to weather as well. But if you test it at other times, it, it might not be there. So again, the regularity that, it, that a, um, a drone allows you to um, watch and monitor that environmental impact is very important. Yeah. I'm just having a laugh in the background. There was a comment um, that the squeaks that you can hear in the audio is actually the Telstra internet mouse running the hamster wheel. Oh, there you go. That's probably right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, our last story, and this one we should have some audio. If it doesn't come up immediately, bear with me and I'll try and get it happening. Um, but this is really cool. This is a Young Australian of the Year finalist in Western Australia, um, and he's been doing some stuff with some drone footage and photography. Let's have a look at that. Wow.
Beautiful. We do have a problem with audio. Sorry about that. So we've got a problem with our audio today from um, our video playback and apologies for that. I did see it before the show and um, I thought I'd fixed it, but that was not to be. The interesting thing about this particular video, A, it is gorgeous. Um, B, the particular footage is um, filmed by someone who um, used to be very connected with the water, um, but unfortunately he had an accident and he's no longer able to go diving and so forth. Um, but he's now using a drone to be mobile and his next kind of adventure, he wants to get into some underwater um, UAV to help his uh, reconnection uh, back to the water under underwater. Um, he used to go scuba diving. But um, we're actually having him come as a guest on the program in a couple of weeks time. So that'll be really cool. And of course, the first question that I will be asking, because I know people will be thinking this about flying around marine mammals. Uh, there are some very, very strict rules around it in Australia, so you need special permission if you are going to fly that close to marine mammals um, or anywhere near them like that. So, um, of course, um, with the, a, a person who's researching um, that kind of thing would have an approval to do it. So just uh, if you're thinking about it yourself, be very, very careful. Absolutely. And just just making an assumption here, I, I did speak to him on the phone. I didn't ask him that question, but certainly all of this footage has been um, published in um, Sydney Morning Herald and related um, publications. I would be very surprised if he could publish that without having the appropriate approvals in place. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. That's no problem at all. But again, if you don't have the approval, you shouldn't go flying over marine mammals yourself. No, the same rules apply to manned aircraft around marine mammals on 1,500 feet um, and uh, it, it both laterally and horizontally, depending on the actual state that you're flying in. But, of course, um, you know, they, they're actually uh, unsure of the effect. We know that aircraft do uh, affect. But, of course, UAVs making a lot less uh, print, uh, probably going to in the future uh, be using a lot of our tech to, um, to hope fully help their um, way of life as well. Yeah. So we'll leave that there and we'll we'll go and catch up with him in a couple of weeks when he is our guest. But speaking of guests, we have someone now. Welcome Oni Jiri. There we go. And at that exact moment, our internet and her face, she's <laughs> frozen up. Are you there? Okay, look, you reconnect and I'll have a chat to John. We'll talk a little bit more about what you've been doing. You come back in a couple of minutes. So, John, you've been um, flying out west and so forth. You've been obviously doing those council um, briefings. What Have you done any other flying yourself? Uh, not in the last couple of days. Um, we've been pretty excited, um, uh, basically, uh, getting some uh, new tech going. We're looking at converting one of our larger fixed wings into a VTOL aircraft. So we've got robotic uh, knee servos. This is a little tip. Uh, they're very, very affordable, but if you want to actually tilt uh, fixed wing propellers up, um, you can buy quite cheaply uh, a good servo, ball bearing servo, uh, and just Google robotic knee servos. And uh, we can grow some great mods to be had. And I can see our guest coming in the background. You should go back because her picture looks a lot better than mine. <laughs> Let's change the shot of you there, Nolly. Hi. Yeah, she is. Hi. <laughs> Welcome and thank you for joining. So um, you, you're currently, where are you physically in, in Australia at the moment? I'm in Melbourne at the moment. You're in Melbourne. Okay. Yeah. And you, you don't seem to have an Australian accent. No, I don't really have an Australian accent. <laughs> uh. Okay. So obviously you're traveling here. Your, your origins are from France, I gather. Yes, exactly. Okay. And what brought you to Australia? I came here after my studies, I needed a sort of break and there's a visa uh, called Working Holiday Visa that's available in Australia yeah. and uh, I came here on holiday but I wanted to be able to stay long enough to visit everything so uh, I wanted to be able to work as well so I started working, saving money and then travelled everywhere and then uh, I ended up staying. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> okay. Now, based on the fact that you're on a show called Oz by a Drone, you must like flying. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> so how long have you been flying for? Um, I f was flying a little line of sight drones in France before I came to Australia. So that was 2014, something mm -hmm. like this. Yeah. Um, and then uh, when I came to Australia, because I was traveling so much, I couldn't have any aircraft with me or anything like that. So I had to stop. And then I started again with the FPV when mm -hmm. uh, I discovered Roto Riot YouTube channel. Yeah. And it was in uh, 2016, December 2016, I started. And only last year, um, I really started getting into drones and these kind of things. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I've got a couple of videos that I wanted to share and chat about. Now, we're, as I said before, we're having trouble with the audio. So we've got no audio on the videos today. At least we know we're not going to get any YouTube copyright strikes from these. So <laughs> okay. Let's play the first one. So this is a video of you unboxing a drone. What, what <laughs> yeah. was this? So um, it was uh, more than a year ago. Um, it was uh, a drone that I from uh, Steel Davis, um, who is Mr. Steel uh, in the drone community, and he sent it to me um, as a surprise. Actually, I had no idea he was sending that. He just told me, can I have your mailing address? I'm sending you something. And uh, he just wanted me to, he wanted to support me because he liked what I was doing um, on YouTube and everything like that. And he said, it would and, be. And you, you got the drone, and already two minutes later, you're pulling it apart. <laughs> yes, because he told me to change the receiver in, in it. And uh, I had to add some more options with my camera, change the, the antenna, this kind of things. <laughs> okay. Okay. So. I'm just going to do something or get my producer to do something on that um, second camera. Can you click the no to the left, John's camera to mute it so we can get rid of the traffic in our ears in the rendezvous dashboard. There's a, one of those buttons there. There we go. That's better. So John, you're on mute at the moment, so we can still chat. That's better. <laughs> um, so, and then you've been doing some FPV flying. Now, obviously you said you were just flying with a, a, a non-FPV quad previously flying line of sight and you've transformed and you've changed and doing some pretty amazing things. Tell me about that process. Um, so the little drone I was flying line of sight in France was like a micro drone. It was called a Lady, Ladybird. It's very, mm -hmm. very small drone and very unstable. Nothing, it has nothing to do with the drones we have now in freestyle and racing. But um, I started uh, with a five inch carbon frame, you know, the standard freestyle frame. Um, mm -hmm. And I had my FPV camera on it, some secondhand stuff that I got from my partner. <laughs> and uh, I was using screens and no goggles when I started. So I could see, still see my, la my um, quad line of sight, which was very handy to mm -hmm. like land and and take off because it's easier, you know, line of sight when you start. And then when I got more confident, I bought secondhand uh, goggles. And, okay. And then it was game on. <laughs> okay. So generally speaking, though, going back to the whole engineering thing, obviously you've you've did you have an engineering background, or did that come along when you started playing with this? No, my studies that I uh, finished in France before going to Australia, it was being a mechanical engineering uh, engineer. So th that was that field that I did, mm -hmm. um, which is very general in French uh, in France, because I noticed when I say mechanical engineer here, people think uh, something very precise. Mm -hmm. Whereas in France, it means more like a bit of electronics, a bit of uh, heavy industry engineering, a bit of production line, organization, uh, some coding as well on computers. It's very, very um, large as a field in, in France. So. Okay. Yeah. So anyone who's wanting to get into engineering, particularly women in engineering, uh, particularly my young producer over here to my left, if she's interested in engineering, encourage her to get into drones and building her own quads, yeah? Um, yeah, I think it... it at least it's not exactly the same thing. Well, I don't know about Australia engineering programs and these kind of things, but um, I think it helps being more familiar with uh, technique. Like, because it's easy to learn theory, but drones brings you like the, the, the real thing. You know, you have to, to, to build things. You have to use computers, softwares, tune your quad, all these kind of things. That's more 
yeah, it's the real thing. It's not only theory. So speaking of tuning your quad, obviously when you got Mr. Steele's quad, that was pretty well tuned when you got it? Yes, it was the most, uh, the best tuned quad I've ever tried before, um, ever at that time. Yeah. It, it's super cool to fly it. The rate were not exactly adapted to my flying at that time because I had been flying only for four or five months uh, FPV at that time. So it was the rate I had to change later on, but the, the tuning of the quad was was on point <laughs> yeah okay and um we, we've got one more video and just this one i wanted to throw up just for a little bit of fun yes everyone loves to see crashes and <laughs> this is six months worth of your crashes and the way the reason i see this is interesting we had a guest on a few I weeks back to say something in French. oh we, I've got I've got a phantom voice over here. There's someone um, who speaks to me on um, Discord for private oh. messages back in case we've got audio problems or whatever. And he's saying you've got to say something in French. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I um, will maybe <laughs> in, in a minute. But back to this crashes. So th yeah. in the world of FPV, you <laughs> someone told me you measure your flying success in the number of bags of propellers that you've used. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but you use, so you go through a lot of propellers, like definitely. Um, in racing, maybe a bit less because racing, you can use more damaged props. It doesn't matter if you're training, but freestyle, if, if you use any session as a potential footage you're going to put online, you need you need good props. Otherwise, the footage will look a bit like, you know, shaky or not, yeah. not not clear enough yeah look yeah. certainly there's some great crashes there and <laughs> yeah. everyone does it and you know i'm i'm the first to say in my own experience i'm i'm coming from the photography gps drone background but recent only recently started playing on a simulator getting ready to go and try the real thing but it's certainly a different different feeling flying yeah, yeah. yeah. definitely it's a lot of fun yes so what's next for you? You're, you're, you're going to continue um, your working holiday around Australia? So uh, my working holiday visa is over and I'm now on a uh, permanent residency visa. So I'm a permanent resident in Australia mm -hmm. and I'm going to try to get citizenship next year. Um, so I have to, to pass a test. Uh, and Australia's internet has done what it does. So at this point, we'll bring John's audio back. So unmute John. Are you there? I'm here. Yeah. Welcome to Australia, the third world. Telstra, our show. We love you. Um, it was great having Oni Jiri, um, but she says the actual word, her name of her channel is actually a Japanese name, Oni Giri. Um, but that's go and check her out. We've got the um, link being played out in the chat. Please do go to her channel. And uh, I believe she's normally based in Melbourne or well, no, was it was it Brisbane? I think I she's think in, it was Melbourne. Yeah, it well, was she's Melbourne. in Melbourne at the moment, but I think her home oh. base was Brisbane. So, um, okay. you know, check out some of her channel. And if you want to meet up and do stuff with meeting up with quads and stuff, it is so much fun. And um, I'll get there one day when I get my my thumb skills up. Yes, the way to go. Different uh, world. It's fun to watch that footage too, some fine flying. Uh, a great little site too. Are you back there, Nolly? No, she's not back. She's disconnected totally. What we're going to do now, I did plan to have, um, you know, we've, we normally do stump the yank with our guests. Now, obviously, um, Onijiri is, uh, you're back, you're back. If I at my pace. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So we were just saying thank you very much for being here. But as our guest, you know, we normally have Stump the Yank. But in, in the absence of an American here today, we're going to do Squash the Frog. <laughs> squash oh. the Frog. <laughs> yeah, <do that. laughs> yeah. okay. please, for, please forgive our sense of humour. That's all right. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> so, John, you've got some um, questions and answers that I sent to you before. If I yes. put the question up, can you read out the four possible answers? Absolutely. Here we go. What is the meaning of cactus? Is it uh, a very thorny item, a shot of tequila, a non-Indigenous plant, or it's broken? 
Yeah, I think I know this one. Oh, um, good. Go ahead. I'm not sure. I think it's broken. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Congratulations. So well, th this is these are going to be on your test to become an Australian citizen. You realise that. You're going to yeah. need to be able to answer cactus for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We've got one more. What is 4X? Is it um, the size of your mother-in-law's dress? Uh, is it uh, something that's expensive or a beer in Queensland? Oh, that's hard. Um... Could be something else 4X as well, but we'll leave that one alone. Is it adult only? <laughs> uh, no, don't go there. 4X. Um, you should have seen that perhaps. In Brisbane. Uh, I'm not sure. I would say it's a beer in Queensland. Ah, yeah. Yep. Look, if in doubt anything, it's a beer. I mean, you know, <laughs> you, you'll usually get that right. 4X, <laughs> yes, is a beer. Uh, oh, right. in, indeed, well done. And you have now passed your citizenship question <laughs> test. That's all you need. A beer and cactus. So there all you right. go. You're in. Okay. That's well done, Noelle. Good work. Look, thanks for joining us. We, we enjoy having different people from different parts of the globe. Um, particularly, we love having people from different parts of Australia. And as our future new Aussie, thank you and welcome. And uh, we hope to have you come back and join us again in the future. Hopefully, yeah. I really enjoyed it. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you. You're welcome to stay in the background. And if there's anything you want to chat about, throw your two cents in. You're more than welcome to. But let's no move on. So next on the list today, we've got, we're giving away the Osmo Mobile. We keep telling you about this every week. So anyone who wants to enter, there's a video on our channel page. Please go to that video. Our subscriber count, I don't know if this is going to work today because we had a few fun things. There we oh, go. We're up. currently at 805. And we got, thank you, Ken Heron, for sending us some subscribers. Oh, someone. <laughs> that always happens. That always happens. Every time you put me on the screen, it's going to go down, I know. If they do it, that's what happens. <laughs> yeah. So, look, our target is to hit 1,000, that magic number. When we hit there, we're giving away the Osmo Mobile, and it's going to be randomly picked. So please do enter that competition if you haven't already done so. And here's one other thing. Go and send out a tweet or a Facebook post now, as we speak right now, saying, I'm watching Oz by a Drone. Come join with me. Um, you know, that's going to help get a few more people in our channel and help us to give away that Osmo Mobile faster. Now, before we go away from the topic of competitions, we did last week ask people to send in some freestyle videos. Because we were having Onigiri here this week, or Onigiri, um, I wanted to have some freestyle videos to play and share, but no one sent anything in. So we've got no winner this week, but the we'll ask for the same thing next week, right? So if you can, Nolly, go and ask some of your buds to go and send in some stuff, what are we giving away? A tube of Vegemite. <laughs> okay. Survival gear, that is. That, that's that's snake bite kit in this country. Now, <laughs> is, is Onigiri's mic still up? Nolly's mic? Let's put that mic back up because that way she can respond over here. And um, speaking of Vegemite, we've got something to share now. Stan Cook won a competition a little while back and he's taken a video of him with his prize. Let's play the video. Now, the audio is not there and this would have been much better with the audio. You've just got to imagine... And this is going to be really bad, actually, come to think of it. I tell you what, this is Stan. <laughs> You've got to imagine we're happy little Vegemite song and Stan is getting really, really super excited about it. Um, oh, he's doing the spoon. He's doing the spoon. Uh, it's annoying that the audio is not working today. You can progress from the spoon to direct to the tube injection. Here we go. Got the spoon going. Ah, <laughs> oh, yeah. I know that look. <laughs> but then he comes up and says, I love it. <laughs> so he's having a bit of fun with it. That's great. But for an American to try Vegemite, that's well done and thank you for yep. that. Now, here's – oh, this is – so frustrating. I tell you what, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to get you, John, I'm going to put you full screen 
Ah, uh, that's scary. That's scary by itself. And I'm going to go over to the computer and see if I can fix the audio. Um, but you can just have a little chat with Nolly in the background and have a chat about anything and I'll see if I can make the audio work because we've still got some video to come. I'll be back. Absolutely. I, uh, uh, Noelle, I was going to ask about no-fly zones and, and those sort of things uh, flying in France perhaps. You might have had some experience with that. What are the current regulations for flying uh, in France? No, can't hear me either. Oh, that's okay. I'm the only one left, folks. So always good to know when you're going to travel. Uh, what the what, what the regs might be. Uh, Greg's got some footage of the Philippines later. I might jump forward to a couple of one of our other topics uh, just so we can keep the time rolling. Um, we've got the new Mavic 2 Enterprise came out this week. I don't know if anyone's had a look at that. I'm sure we've got some video of it. It's pretty exciting. Um, it's basically the Mavic 2 with the zoom camera on it, but it's also got uh, a way of attaching various things to the top of the aircraft. So you can have spotlights, you can have a speaker, all sorts of fantastic little things. It looks really good. So and, I'm uh, back, John. Let's do oh, this. I, I had no luck with the audio today. It's one of those days. So what we are going to do, we do indeed have some stuff about DJI. So we've got a feature segment on DJI. Let's get into that right now. And we've got three sections. The first one is talking about um, building a wall, so to speak. Now, you know, in, in America, they're building a wall across borders. We're talking about building a wall in front of no-fly zones. Now, they've previously had their geo system, but DJI have updated their geo system. And uh, with that most recent update, instead of just doing a radius around an airport, we've now got the bow tie kind of image around the airport. And there's three versions of that based on if it's a large airport, a medium-sized or a small untowered airport. <clears throat> yes, these guidelines have come from ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, and all of the member countries, of which there are 155, I believe, um, uh, try to subscribe to the same idea. The bow tie uh, allows a lot more accessible airspace. Um, you will notice if you look closely around towered airports, the circular no-fly zone that we see, uh, exclusion zone, will, uh, although it'll open up the airspace, should be limited to 45 metres altitude um, rather than 120 metres. So there's still some exclusion in it. The bow tie um, area, of course, is the actual no-fly zone where uh, in DJI aircraft they won't arm. And, you know, the debate will always rage on. Um, I'm not necessarily a big fan of it um, because I think the technology is not quite mature enough yet to, to implement in terms of an enforcement um, that's another a, a subject. But looking just at the diagrams themselves in terms of bow tie, um, it does signal good news for accessible airspace if you live uh, inside. Perhaps your backyard is inside the uh, three nautical mile, 5.5 kilometre area where you'd be able to fly at your house up to 45 metres. Yeah. Um, with, and, and towered airports too. Non-controlled airports here, we're looking at a bow tie without um, the circular exclusion zone as well. And currently in this country, the only rule is if you're aware of a manned aircraft around a non-controlled airport, you must land or not take off. Mm. So that's where we're at. Um, DJI constantly trying to keep pace with no-fly zones and, and working a balance between their customers and the regulators. And that's what they're juggling here, um, the, both those balls in the air at once um, and, and getting it right so their customers are happy. Um, the operators are happy, the commercial operators are happy using their aircraft, but also the regulators uh, see DJI to being uh, active in terms of um, uh, compliance. I'll just say that I am a fan of the concept, but not the implementation. Yeah. The control of approving or not approving needs to be in the hand, it's hands of the regulator or air services, one or the other, don't care how that gets done, not in control of a third party country that's got no place being a policeman in our country. Agreed. So let's see what that, how that rolls out. Um, and it'll be interesting to keep watching that as they further uh, get on with that. All right, next one. So next topic is um, hacking and the Mavic 2. So people might be aware of um, a group called No Limit Drones. Um, no Limit Drones have put together an application to replace the DJI Assistant, but also doing other tweaks and mods to your DJI aircraft 
than what the manufacturer might like. For example, disabling no-fly zones. Now, we do encourage people to fly safely, but this kind of gets away from um, the annoyance, the way the system has been implemented. But what is interesting, um, the, the team have actually gone and said, OK, the, the Mavic 2, they've implemented it slightly differently. They've got something new called Trust Zone which is an ARM CPU thing inside there. And, you know, it's a lot more hardened. So basically, the manufacturer of the Trust Zone system, unlike DJI, they actually pay for fixing bugs. All oh, right. Right. So those vulnerabilities get fixed as soon as they are found. The fact that DJI is using it does make it more secure. But here's the interesting but. So there's a team of people that have got some serious dollars together um, from the registration fees of that application. So no limit drones, all of that money's gone into a pool and the people who are reverse engineering are actually getting boards and pieces and components that they can use to crack the aircraft. So two things. One, if you want to support that, um, please do go to the No Limit Drones website, link is in the description, and uh, register a copy for yourself. Um, and secondly, there's also the ability to put in some donations into the Mavic 2 reverse engineering effort if you're interested in that. Well done. So moving on, we move on to the uh, enterprise story. Beam me up, Scotty. Now, yes, I did. Uh, when I had my little time alone uh, with the listeners, I, I talked about the Mavic uh, 2 Enterprise um, just as a brief in introduction. Uh, and that's what we're going to be talking about now. It's a, it's a, a, a basically shows the confidence in the Mavic continues to grow as a, as a format then well, I think that people now are debating whether it really is the end of the Phantom. We're seeing the Mavic being uh, pushed so hard in terms of what's available in its technology. You can see some of the things there. The spotlights coming on the aircraft. You can have a speaker so that you can uh, actually, and we're going to see all sorts of things, extra camera, infrared, uh, you name it. Lots and lots of things that, um, and the Mavic uh, 2 Enterprise with the OcuSync 2 has some really, really strong features. Um, and we're more so than the portability of the aircraft. I, I think that it's, um, first of all, it's, you know, around uh, still under 800 grams. So in terms of risk, uh, it's a low risk, lightweight machine, uh, very much so in the excluded category. But also um, in, in terms of its uh, flight time and, um, and its reliability, I think it's a very, very strong aircraft. Um, Martin, one of the pilots that uh, flies with us, has just received his Mavic uh, 2 with a Hasselblad camera, and uh, he's telling us great stories about that. I think if you roll back to when the Mavic first came out, the Mavic Pro, the thing that surprised most people was just the, the actual build quality of this thing. And I went on record as saying I didn't think DJI built it. I think that they actually bought it from another designer. It looked like a clean sheet design to me, away from anything they'd built before and uh, perhaps someone else had developed it. Now, I've got no real evidence of that, but it is such a, a, a remarkably different aircraft to the other DJI aircraft. Um, certainly uh, very much a part of the DJI fleet now, maybe one of their biggest sellers, one of their most capable aircraft. So uh, the DJI uh, Enterprise, the Mavic 2 Enterprise, an absolutely incredible piece of tech um, and very much uh, uh, something that we'll, we'll see lots of commercial use. Let me um, let me throw the Dorothy Dixer up. So you've got the the Mavic Two and you've got the Mavic Enterprise. There's the, two versions of the Mavic Two to start with. We've got one with a. 20 so let's play with the zoom because it's the closest camera to the Enterprise. So that's correction. That's zoom. And look, it's a, uh, I believe it's a two times optical zoom and a three times digital zoom um, mm -hmm. with the controls. They're very easy on your thumb um, to zoom in. Now, that's not a, a remarkable zoom. You know, of course, on your Matrice, you've got a 30 times optical zoom. Let me tell you, that's an, a, a beautiful piece of kit, but certainly a lot heavier uh, when you and, and a lot more expensive in terms of the aircraft. And I wouldn't be wanting having a, a Matrice at the moment or, or an Inspire 2. But again, the interchangeable camera. My one question about the Enterprise was the interchangeability of the camera. We can put all these lights and speakers on top. Why couldn't we um, make the camera interchangeable so we could go from the Hasselblad camera to the Zoom camera and perhaps uh, a camera in the future? There's an interesting question. Assuming if you have a look at the Mavic 2 Pro and the fact that it is 
advertised to be manufacturer interchangeable and that there are already people doing it themselves. Yes. I would say that this would be possible with the enterprise as well. Um, I, I, that's a stretch in terms of the way the camera connects. One of the things about a removable camera is the sophistication of the gimbal device and how it's attached. Now, those that have an Inspire know just how this works and how it clips on and what the, the, the uh, really needs some robust connections there if you're going to change a camera. And that's why DJI have avoided it. In you know, they've, Even in the Phantom 5 suggested tech, we've got interchangeable lenses, uh, which is very easy, but pulling cameras on and off is a, a big deal in terms of, of mm. the tech and how it works. I don't think that that's just necessarily a commercial reason that the cameras aren't interchangeable. We've been asking for a while and people talk about having retractable legs and a 360 degree gimbal, all those things um, that are, can, of course, add weight and complexity to the aircraft. Um, I think that a, a Mavic Enterprise uh, interchangeable camera uh, will be in the future. I can see uh, you certainly that aircraft getting bigger. I mean, they still want to keep it um, down in the sub 800 gram area. Uh, because that's a that's a make a big thing for the portability as well, and also the battery life and flight times and so forth. But um, it, it's a good look. I th I haven't actually used it, so I'm not going to comment on the quality of the camera or what it is. But in terms of an aircraft and build, again, back to the original Mavic that we saw, the Mavic Pro, the build quality is exceptional on that aircraft. You can't put it up against anything else in um, that price bracket, I believe, um, with that, that type of build quality. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just going back to what I was thinking about before, the differences between the um, the Mavic 2 Zoom and the Enterprise, the attachable bits, number yep. one, right? And I believe they come with it. Um, number two, the, the geotagging of the photos, I believe is different and superior in the way that it's being done. Yep, um, that might be a, a function of OcuSync 2. Now, here's a little bit of tech for you that we think is interesting because, you know, uh, on a sideline, the RTK version of the Phantom 4 has come out. Hmm. If we were able to, and this is a, a software stretch as well, if you are able to have received cause-corrected GPS data to your receiver and you stood in one place, you could actually improve the GPS um, uh, accuracy of the aeroplane and using the controller as a pseudo base station. Uh, and transmitting that data um, to the aircraft, so it's a it's a it's a little bit of a stretch in the tech. But of course, now that they've got the Phantom 4 RTK, I don't think you're going to see it on the smaller uh, quads anytime soon. But again, look for that in the future. At the moment, if you want to have a Phantom 4 RTK, you've got to buy a six and a half thousand dollar base station, uh, and the aircraft will cost you eight and a half thousand. Um, it, that's a sort of very high end survey aircraft, but. Uh, without doing survey uh, or even uh, acknowledging the, the advantage of doing survey, corrected course corrected GPS data is centimetric accurate. And in terms of the aircraft maintaining its position, uh, accurate landings where you could land this thing, you could land an RTK um, uh, aircraft on top of a beer can. Um, and, you know, it, that that's the kind of, of accuracy. Perhaps that's an exaggeration somewhat. Um, but... Oh, sorry, there was, um, that was uh, home calling, ET. Uh, but having that kind of tech inside the aircraft, I think we're going to be looking at in the future um, where the base station, you might have to initially have your controller on a fixed stand on the ground like a tripod, uh, leave it there for 10 minutes until it starts receiving the cause data. But wow, that, that will uh, open up another world of GPS accuracy. Um, remembering that GPS was never really designed um, to for centimetric accuracy at all. It was it was a, it's a much more loose, uh, if you like, positioning um, that we're using for now. So the tagging, I, I think one of the other strong things about the Mavic Enterprise is the OcuSync 2 um, that, that DJI have developed. That is a very, very good um, a, a telemetry link, C2 link for the aircraft as well. Uh, OcuSync 2, very, very strong. I'm just trying to search for it, but I know that there was... Um... A comment in the chat just now, I thought um, existing DJI equipment was already geotagged. Yes, it is. And I can't remember what specifically was different to um, the way that happens in the enterprise, but I did read that there was a, a variation there. Yeah, okay. So, we yes, of course, the EXIF data on the JPEG uh, images that comes in uh, has lots and lots of um, uh, information apart from position, GPS position, altitude, and camera settings and so forth. 
um, e- even the the lens information as well is, is kept um, uh, and, and kept in the EXIF file. Uh, again, uh, whether the OcuSync two uh, or the GPS accuracy um, is just better in the tag. I, I'm not sure what they're adding in terms of the tag. That would um, be awkward for some software that's reading uh, EXIF files. You'd have to have some modifications there too. Mm. We're guessing, folks. Um, well, we haven't seen the aircraft, so um, you know we're we're um, putting it out there. But let let's ask our very uh, uh, good knowledge base out there, our listeners, to uh, to check it out, and perhaps we can find out. And the last difference was around um, security and privacy and all of those kind of things. You can run the um, the enterprise aircraft in a uh, lights out kind of mode where it's not going to communicate back to DJI servers in any way, shape or form. Really good for security and sensitive installations. Um, and, you know, some increased security around the data is certainly advertised as well. That's a, a, a field just quickly that, that DJI has wrestled with because of the data that's sent back. Um, there are corporate responsibilities for companies that are doing survey work and, and uh, you know, information gathering, data collection, that if you actually have a copy of that, uh, the, the, not the privacy issue, the corporate privacy issue extends um, beyond what's allowed. And so they've got to have that at the moment because GJI exposes themselves to litigation uh, when the companies have responsibility, that you, you, mm. you have to have that to use the aircraft if you were flying on sensitive sites and so forth to provide um, that confidentiality. Yep. Okay, let's move in. We're going to go on with our last section of the day, our regular section, Explore Australia. We're off to see the wizard. Now, apologies again, we still don't have audio for this, but we'll play the clip anyway, and um, we'll have a chimwag about the, what we've got there. So let me get my notes. Having all, having almost. been having been distracted by the audio before the first one is Lono FPV. Yeah, um, look, it just looks like a game to me. It's fantastic, uh, you know, like a car racing game. It's almost surreal uh, in terms of the 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 level of flying skill here um, and the setup. Just great stuff. Drifting cars. So Look this is filmed in Tasmania, and um, indeed it is drifting. This is filmed at Simmons Plains for the DCA Tasmanian Matsuri, um, filmed by Lono FPV. Um, this raceway is a motor racing circuit in Australia located about 30 kilometres south of Launceston, Tasmania. Awesome. Oh, he's picked up a little bit of rubber on the screen there. I saw it. Yep, <laughs> see it there. That's a bit of burning rubber off the tyres, my guess. He's that close. Um, yeah. Really great flying here um, in terms of, you know, it, FPV flying where you're flying around buildings and surfing around structures. But a moving car requires absolutely um, impeccable skill. Great work. And then uh, coming up in a few moments, the next one we're going to have a look at is going to be in Perth, Western Australia. That's coming up very shortly. Normally I'd hear the sound. Ah, there we go. There's a magic sound telling you that it's going to the next clip. This is um, Carlos filmed this. Bell's Rapids Drone FPV in Perth, Western Australia. It's a 2.5 kilometre loop, loop walk at Bell's Rapids known for being one of the best vantage points in the Swan River. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful location. Man, if you lose that quad, it's going to get wet, let me tell you. <laughs> Again, uh, you're not collecting the pieces there. <laughs> That's good work. Yeah. Uh, under the bridge and, of course, flying around water FPV. One of the more difficult challenges of flying over water FPV is, is um, uh, in particularly still water, um, is um, the judging your altitude. Um, it is so hard. Water. Very, very difficult to tell your height. And obviously here with a, a good background of the rocks and structures uh, makes it a lot easier. But when you're flying out over open water, the altitude's a real uh, tough one to nail. Mm. You can tell when you got it wrong anyway because you start seeing <laughs> fish. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Some beautiful Australian locations there as well in yeah. Western Australia. WA. After this, I'll get you to put your camera out the window and uh, 
show us around where you are today in a couple of minutes as well. Again, apologies, we don't have the audio track in the background. I can put some in. <laughs> yeah, that, Moving on, we've got Dale Priam. This is in um, North Queensland, tropical North Queensland, in the Douglas Shire and uh, areas close to there. Yep. All, all shot within a few hours of Port Douglas, Snapper Island, Low Eyes, M Mowbray oh, Falls, yeah. Mount Lewis, Lake Mitchell, Mossman Gorge, Mowbray River, Daintree River, Thorns Beach, Barron Falls, Cooktown, Raven Show, Lake Tinaroo and Bloomfield Falls. So if you want to have a look at some really, really good um, video footage around North Queensland, Dale Priam, his channel is, link is in the description. Do go and check that out. There's lots and lots of um, really good footage there to have a look at. Beautiful. Now, the Lake Chinaroo area, they have the platypus, Greg, uh, and some of the rivers there. It's a beautiful area, and uh, I've been lucky enough to go and see platypuses in the wild. Um, I'm sure our international guests are familiar with the platypus. It's the otter with that looks like a duck. <laughs> it's got a duck bill and webbed feet. Um, one of the more unusual creatures um, uh, that uh, in the world, in fact, as a species, they're quite shy. Um, but uh, in the wild, they're quite amazing to see. Love the sun flare. Yep. There we go. The golden hour. So we're going back now to Western Australia. Um, this one's filmed by Top Down Approach. Yep. First... It's a southern, or maybe, I'd be guessing, but um, help me with that. Is it the southern coast? Oh, no. Here we go. This would be the north. Um, he says, first drone project filmed while travelling up the west coast of Australia in yep. August 2018 in a camper. Don't oh, have yes. much other detail about the exact locations, but um, again, every time I look at this every week, we've got our footage from shot from all around Australia and uh, we, we've got a great country. You've got crocodile, crocodiles up in this area. Um, and uh, you can usually spot them uh, with your aircraft uh, sunbaking on the bank at first, um, but um, most definitely in the streams and rivers up there, you get some pretty big crocs. So, Ken, make sure you um, bring your croc protection when you come to Australia if you're going to be around there. Be nice to see some footage of uh, wild crocodiles. We did doing, have one that I was going to show one week, but unfortunately I couldn't get the rights to use you, that one. You put the bite on it. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, in a couple of minutes, we've got our friend Ferg Taz, who we um, seem to use a lot of his material on now, a regular a basis. For our yeah. people sending in, if you ever get a chance like that, that was a great shot, a selfie. Um, with a wine away, maybe as, and your footage, you know, you could think about that because it's always great to see um, where you're perhaps standing when you're shooting some of these things, but also a bit of a selfie as well. Uh, get there, so think about that, folks. If you're if you're out and um, creating this kind of stuff, throw in one of those um, with a zoom out, perhaps, and and uh, it's always interesting from a flyer's point of view, um, perhaps where you were standing, uh, where you shot it from. Uh, when you're shooting some of these um, some of these shots, particularly the remote ones, perched on a rock perhaps, uh, or somewhere um, next, sitting next to the car, uh, always fun. Oh, look at that! And uh, in a couple of minutes, we've got the ovation of the seas visiting Hobart as our last video of the day. So this one's from Ferg Taz, one of our yeah. regulars. Now, this one's um, a special one just for my parents because they absolutely love cruising. They seem to be going on boats more than they're staying at home. Why not? Great idea. The Ovation of the Seas. <clears throat> it's a cruise ship um, operating for Royal Caribbean International. Um, this vessel is the third in the Quantum class, which is... Um, bigger than their previous Freedom class ships by over 14,000 tonnes, becoming the second largest class of passenger ships behind the Oasis class. Sails mainly from Tianjin during the northern summer season 
and repositions to Sydney during the southern summer season? Now, I'm looking at that, and John, what are you thinking? Well, I'm thinking the same thing you are, and a lot of people who of our flyers are watching are thinking exactly the same thing. So it, it's awkward in a, in a thing like this, folks, when you're really admiring someone's work um, and you have got a safety head on you thinking about mitigating what risks might have been involved there. So if we go through them, and let's just say it's a beautiful piece of video, um, the radar at the front of the ship can be a real nasty one. So you might be flying along there and all of a sudden get a spike of radar energy that will topple the aircraft down into the bridge. Um, uh, obviously, the smokestack wouldn't be a good place to crash either or in the pool area where there are people. So, um, of course, you don't know whether the aircraft was um, a, had a permission to fly within 30 metres of people on a, on a ship like this, but... You know, you can do a standoff video where you keep your 30 metre exclusion zone. The overfly um, is, a, is a push um, in every way in terms of, you know, you're pushing the, the safety right out the window there. Um, and the, and I like to point it out because the risk aren't always obvious. It's not about people. That, but that radar unit um, flying over the smokestack, all that sort of stuff, you know. So, you know, without taking – I really don't want to be a downer on, on a nice piece of video, but I certainly want our listeners to know – that you and I were thinking exactly the same thing <laughs> and yeah, probably look, a lot of other people. We, yeah, like a lot of people get down on people who are seen as the drone police. We don't want to be the drone police, but we do want to say, A, get permission, B, think about the risks. Yeah, that's right. Well, you know, we're, we're a commercial operator. You work for me. And uh, if my guy showed up with a video like that, we'd have to have a sit-down talk, a big one. Um, yeah. And purely because you would risk uh, in this country, that's a nine thousand dollar fine right there. Yeah, I'm just looking at um, the comments in the chat. I thought that all cruise ships are anti drone. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, John, you were you were doing some work on a cruise ship a little while back. Yeah, I've been on a couple of cruise ships. Um, they, if you're on board, of course, they actually quarantine your aircraft. So you're allowed to take it, but when you check in, they'll quarantine it. And if you go and have a, uh, a, a fly, I want to have a fly at one of the destinations, you can, you can have it out of quarantine um, and uh, get, a, get it for the flying perhaps on an island somewhere if it's allowed, but they won't allow you to have it on the ship itself. Um, look, you know, th there's good, good reasons for that. If you're out at sea and you decide to have a fly around, there are dangers involved, but Again, you know, we hate to be seen as, as the drone police, but we, we also like to send the message to have a think about, always have a think about where you're flying um, and do it safe, folks. That's the way to do it. So I'll leave it up to our listeners again to, to have their comments there, and they will. Um, some will say, come on, um, lighten up a bit. But uh, the, ru the rules are there, and once you've had an accident, um, let me just tell you how expensive that is. Forget the $9,000 fine. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we've come to the end of our time today and um, just a couple of quick community service announcements. If you would like to send us a video, send it to upload at gregkunit.com. We would definitely love to have a look at some of your footage. Also, um, again, I mentioned before, if you could shout out that you're watching this show, let your friends know, that'd be really helpful. That disappeared really quickly. Let me put it back there one more time. We're on YouTube. You can also see us on Twitter and Facebook. I used to have a slide for our postal address if you want to send us anything in the mail. The address is 5 slash 127 Princess Highway, Sylvania. I don't know where the slide disappeared to. I'll have to go and find that later. Probably got lost in the mail. Ah, boom tish. Oh, John. I got a million of them. <laughs> Speaking of which, the drone did reach um, our next person in... Um, in um, Hong Kong, the little spark. So um, that came to Australia and has gone on and it's subsequently been sent off to its next destination. I've got to go and get that footage off the memory cards and send it to Ken so he can do something with it. That's coming soon. But since you told such a great joke, hey Siri, tell me a joke. Why don't koala bears hang around with all the other bears? Because they don't meet the koalifications. Ah, <sighs> Siri's taking a big dive. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's all for this week for Oz by Drone. We did have one other video, but we'll 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 save that up for next week. 
And yep. uh, thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. Please do chuck a like on the video if you like us. If you don't, press the thumbs down. We don't mind if you tell us, but only if you really don't like it. Um, please do subscribe, click the bell, and we'll see you next time. Bye for yep. now. Okay, see you folks. Bye for now. Thank you.